Hi everyone, this is our presentation um, and teaching on IPPB the bird from the clinical educators Nat and Lorna. So we've had a lot of feedback from people about probably feeling not too confident using the bird, choosing different treatments instead of the bird like the clear way or not doing it at all and I think we think this session will be really useful to explore the use of the bird a little bit more and talk about patients that might be useful to use with. So the aims of this session will be to look at the indications, contraindications and precautions for IPPB, think about appropriate patients for IPPB, familiarise with the setup of the machine with a further video, implement implementation of the intervention um, including progression and regression, and how we evaluate our effectiveness of treatment. A little bit about troubleshooting, as we know, there's always something to troubleshoot. And hopefully by the end of the session, feeling more confident with the use of IPPB. So let's just remind ourselves what is IPPB. So intermittent positive pressure breathing. This is a form of ins inspiration um, delivered through positive pressure on the in-breath. So in impacting on tidal volume and reducing respiratory muscle effort. So it's different to PEEP and doesn't in influence FRC. We know that um, with the birds specifically, it gives us 40% oxygen from the wall and can be delivered through a mouthpiece or sometimes with a face mask, although most of the time we use a mouthpiece. As you can see, just demonstrated from the from the graphs here. So just to be really clear, that will influence the tidal volume um, and not FRC, which is directly related to PEEP. So what does it actually do? So like we've just said, it's directly correlated with um, tidal volume. So we're going to be recruiting lung volume. We're reaching higher pressures than we would do at CPAP. So we're raising the tidal volume, like we've said, rather than the FRC. And actually by doing that, we're going to be opening up collapsed alveoli and accessing collateral ventilation. So thinking back to um, sort of uni physiology and sort of taking it right back to basics, we're looking at the channels of Martin, Lambert and pores of Cohen. So really getting into the small airways and opening up collapsed alveoli um, and targeting, targeting areas of collapse. Whereas CPAP, we can think about more of sort of maintaining volume that we've gained, whereas positive pressure delivered through IPPB is more to open up areas of collapse. I think people quite often don't think about the bird and IPPB to be used directly for secretion retention, whereas actually it can be quite useful to sort of get behind secretions, create that turbulent, turbulent airflow to help with clearance. The first thing you do when you take a big, to have a cough is take a big breath in, get behind secretions. So the bird can help people who um, are struggling to take that big breath to generate a strong enough cough. So also helps with secretions, even though it's probably not used for that in the first instance. So a little reminder then about our indications, contraindications, cautions and complications. So indications, like we've just said, can be used for sputum retention, atelectasis, collapse, sort of quite specific lobular collapse, or just generally poor tidal volume, sort of weak or tired patients. Um, but it can't be patients who are unwilling to participate and possibly due to pain. Um, as we need, really do need them to join in with the bird. Contraindications, a bit of a recap. So cardiovascular instability. So we know that any form of positive pressure um, intervention has the potential risk to um, drop our blood pressure, as we know that um, it can potentially um, impact on venous return and drop our blood pressure. Undrained pneumothorax, so again, what we don't want to be doing is putting more pressure into a patient who's already got an air leak. Similar with um, large bulli, so certainly sort of patients with COPD, we just need to be making sure that um, we're aware if they've got any emphysematous bulli, as that can cause um, barotrauma. Bronchopleural fistula, lung abscess, severe hemoptysis, um, sort of tumours, active tube, um, TB 
frank hemoptysis, facial traumas, vomiting or raising to cranial pressure or contraindications to the bird. Um, apart from absolute contraindications, there's some things that we just need to be cautious of um, and sort of weigh up the risk versus benefit. So we talked about um, large emphysematous bulli, so emphysema. It doesn't mean to say that just because they've, they're labelled emphysema that they've got emphysematous bulli. So it's worth checking um, sort of the latest chest X-ray or CT if they've got one. Um, airway tumour. Um, and then thinking about things like deranged platelets, low blood pressure, which again, we've sort of talked about the, the risk of cardiovascularly destabilising somebody. Um, AF sort of fits into that category. Stomach distension, just with the risk of them swallowing air and making that worse. Um, and nausea again, because it probably won't help them to be breathing in lots of um, large volumes of air if they're feeling nauseous. Um, and sort of probably related to some of that stuff, um, some of the complications at the bottom there. So just a little recap of the kit itself. Um, so on the right hand side, we've got the circuit. So we've got um circuit, which is the, the thicker white tubing, and then the thin, clear tubing that runs along the side of it, which is our pressure line. So this is really important that this is plugged into the machine as this will give the feedback to the machine to register the pressure on the manometer on the dial on the front. Um, so we need that. We've got um, the nebulise chamber here, nebul nebulizer chamber here. So this is to pop some saline in for your treatment so that it's not um, horrible dry air. Um, so 0.9% saline, pop a little bit in there um, and that'll help to, like I say, not make it too dry and horrible. We've got the, the mouthpiece which comes in the, the circuit pack here, which we will predominantly use with most of our patients but if you do need to you can swap in a um, an anaesthetic face mask a bit like you use with the clear way instead um, so this is going to attach to our machine into this end here and the pressure line just next to it and then we can re-familiarize ourselves with the dial so we've got the black on off switch at the top um, you can't see it on this diagram but we should have the white oxygen circuit um, tubing which will connect directly into the wall um, into the high flow oxygen port or the, the port where the flow meter is on a ward, on a ward. Um, like I say from the start this will deliver 40% oxygen to the patient um, this way so just refreshing with the dials then so on this side we've got a dial with a lever forwards and backwards for the starting effort so this is going to be how easy it is for the patient to trigger the breath so obviously it's a patient triggered and patient led um, treatment so they are triggering this rather than us delivering mandatory breaths like the clear way on this side we've got the inspiratory pressure dial so this is the limit of what we're going to set for the centimeters of water pressure um, and this corresponds with the the gauge on the front so the manometer on the front here um, we've got the red manual override in here which you can't quite see which we can use to um, take over if the patient isn't quite um, being able to stop the breath or they're, they're sort of tr they're, yeah, they're tr struggling to um, to trigger and struggling to to stop the breath at the end of the cycle this one here is the inspiratory flow dial so again this is just going to be different to the different to the um, pressure pressure dial on the side where the pressure is in centimeters of water and that's the pressure that we're going to be wanting to target whereas this one's the flow rate so flow in liters per minute um which is essentially how fast the breath is coming coming at the patient um this one down here is is a switch that we don't really need to know about all we need to know is that it's turned all the way clockwise to the off position I thought it'd be nice to look through a bit of a case study to sort of pull things together really to think about what sort of patient might be appropriate to to use IPPB with. Um, so this is going to be a case study which could be any sort of post-operative um, 
whether it be a lower GI patient um, or a cardiac surgical patient, someone sort of who's maybe a couple of days post-op. So we're going to sort of focus this around a 62 year old male who has got some mild COPD and hypertension. He stepped down to the ward today and he's struggling with pain a little bit. Called to see a patient. Um, the patient, as they're unable to maintain adequate saturations on five litres face mask, um, they've actually got sats of 88% and we're aiming 94 to 98 so currently not quite reaching their target so one thing we're going to start to think about um before we've even sort of touch base with the patient we've not looked at them yet we've just been told about them um things that we can start to consider are what what pain relief has this patient got you know, have have they received adequate pain relief? Do we need to explore giving them something more to help make our treatment more effective? Um, can the patient cough? So already we're thinking, could there be an element of secretion retention here? You know, what is the patient's cough like? Are they able to follow commands? Um, you know, how awake are they? How cooperative are they going to be? Do, can we get them something before we get there, whether that be pain relief, if they are struggling with pain or, you know, are they written up for any nebulizers? Could they be having a saline nebulizer before you get there if we do think there's an element of secretion retention? How mobile are they? Are, you know, are they able to, to sit up or even better sit out to help their chest? Um, and again, we know that they're maybe not quite meeting their oxygen requirements. So starting to think of alternate oxygen therapy modalities that might be available um, and that we might need to help um, switch them over to. So you get there, we've got a set of OBS. So the patient slumped in the bed when you get there. Um, we've got a set of OBS here, which cardiovascularly quite stable, um, a little bit tachycardic, but GTS is 15 and they're awake and alert. Um, we've got the SATs and the and the respiratory rate there again, so we're not quite meeting um, sufficient oxygen saturations on probably more oxygen than we'd like through a through a face mask. Really, we've had a listen to the chest and they've got reduced breath breath sounds over the left lower zone and some bronchial breath sounds, which probably are best described as sort of hollow sounding breath sounds. Almost I would describe when you're listening to your own breathing through a snorkel. They've actually got some upper airway sort of audible secretions. You can hear them in the upper airway when they're talking. There's some transmitted throughout the upper airways. You've asked them to cough and, and he can cough when you're asking him to, although it's fairly weak um, with reduced effectiveness and he isn't able to clear independently. On coughing as well, complaining of a little bit of pain um, and, and probably is impacting on, on the quality of his cough. So you've seen the patient now and you're starting to think about what else you need to do to start to think about what you're going to what you're going to do from an intervention perspective. So there's a couple of things that we could we could use that we don't have already. So certainly a chest X-ray. First of all, a chest X-ray is useful at any point, whether you've decided what you're going to do or not from an intervention perspective. Um, but certainly a chest X-ray is really important, um, at least an, um, as much up to date one as possible if you're going to do any sort of positive pressure because we want to make sure we're ruling out any pneumothoraces. So have they got a, you know have they got a chest X-ray and if they don't, is it appropriate for them to get another one? I think probably in most circumstances, if you've been called to see a patient who um, has acutely deteriorated and is needing a, a physiotherapy review for their chest, it's probably not. Um, completely ridiculous to ask for an up-to-date chest x-ray so if they don't have one already an abg not vital um but if it's available it can add to your clinical picture um we touched on pain relief haven't we so we, we sort of still don't really know what pain relief they've had and maybe what else is prescribed and if they could have anything um, and what previous physiotherapy have they had what's maybe been successful or unsuccessful to this date um with them because i suppose that might help to guide your treatment so we've we've managed to get our, ourselves a chest x-ray um, and from this we've got what looks like um, something going on left lower lobe so we can't quite make out the left hemidiaphragm we've certainly lost our cardiogenic and costophrenic angle on that on that side um, we've probably got what looks like 
some um, left low lobe collapse. They've got quite a dense opacity sort of sitting behind the heart. Um, and what we can probably see is um, the starting of a sale sign here. So we've got quite a, a straight line here and sort of this double line with the heart border, which is sort of a classic sign of some left low lobe collapse. We don't have an ABG as the patient is on a ward and no one's able to do a stab. Um, and we found out that they've been on some regular paracetamol and dihydrocodone, but they are written up for PRN Oromorph, which um, we've asked them if they can have a little bit of um, before we start to do anything with them. So we can start to pull together some problems, can't we, um, for this patient? So we've already identified that they've got sort of pain that's quite poorly controlled. Um, they're not meeting their oxygen requirements on the oxygen therapy that they've got. Um, we know that he was slumped in bed, so from a positioning perspective, he's not in a great position for any sort of secretion clearance or um, a great position to be working on his lung volumes. We've got some secretion retention, haven't we? And we've got clear evidence of some reduced lung volume with some collapse. So starting to think about the, the treatment modalities that or treatments that sort of fit alongside this. So pain relief, which, which we've sorted um or we're, we're sorting with trying to get him something something um prn for thinking about you know if they're a post-operative patient can they have a towel for supported cough and supported deep breathing you know can we switch them to um to something different from an oxygen therapy perspective instead of being on five liters cold dry oxygen is there something available like a recipe flow or some sort of um humidified system, venturi system. Can we reposition them into a higher sitting position or even better on the edge of the bed or out of bed, depending on how mobile the chap is? And consider adding in um, saline nebulizers if we're feeling like the secretions might be thick and difficult to clear. We can start off with um, sort of quite classic treatments of doing some ACBT and some secretion clearance techniques to see whether or not um, we can shift anything, but probably the next thing that we're going to want to add in for this patient is um, the bird, so IPPB. So why why are we thinking the bird? Why have we chosen the bird? So I think the first thing is that we've acknowledged that the patient is awake and they are alert, and this is really important as the bird really does require your patient to be on board and to to cooperate with the treatment. So. Then we need them to be able to trigger trigger their own breaths. And this is important as the patient will feel more in control. So when we're thinking about why we'd use this over, say, the clear way, I think awake patients who are able to, to comply will actually probably sync better with um, the bird compared to the clear way. As we all know that the clear way is quite passive and will give you mandatory um, pre preset delivered breaths. Um, and like we said, there's a clear, clear, um, there's clear evidence of volume loss and collapse and secretion retention, which we know the bird um, is ideal for and is is indicated. So before we start, we're just going to sort of touch back on some of the potential precautions. So um, we've noted that he's COPD, but we've reviewed the chest X-ray prior to treatment, and, and we're quite happy that there's no bull eye or there's no um, pneumothorax. We've checked him, this chap's OBS, and he's cardiovascularly stable, so we're not concerned that um, we're going to risk his cardiovascular stability um, by introducing positive pressure. He's not on lots of inotropic support or cardiovascular support. And the other thing is just to consider how much oxygen the patient's on. We know that this guy's just on five litres, so sort of taking him off that to bird him where we're going to be getting 40% from the bird he's probably going to be all right whereas certainly if you were taking a patient off um CPAP or higher oxygen requirements you might want something um in between either on at the same time so we know now we've got access to high flow nasal cannulas and things or even just get normal nasal cannula that we can keep on during the treatment because obviously if we're using the mouthpiece um or even if you're having to take somebody off CPAP or NIV to to bird just having a simple face mask with either high flow running through it or um, even a non rebreathe for this sort of in between cycles just to make sure that they've got um, 
good oxygen supply to, to rest on in, in between the cycles. So how are we going to start our treatment then? So I think this is probably where people struggle um, to sort of remember what they should be doing really on how do how do we set how do we set it up? How do we set the bird off? What do we start things at? And then how do we progress our treatment if our patient is getting it? So remember the diagram. So inspiratory pressure. So the dial on the right hand side, we're going to set our limit for our pressure and we'll start in the middle at 20 centimetres of water, which is labelled. Um, on the other side, on the left hand side, the dial is a starting effort. Same again, we'll start in the middle until we, we know what our patient is like and, and what, you know, if they can or they can't trigger particularly well. The inspiratory flow rate, again, to so the top dial on the front, we're going to start that in the middle as well. And what we really want to do from the start is give our patient really clear, um, sort of, yeah, clear and concise instructions. So we're going to tell them to make a nice tight seal with their lips around the mouthpiece. We're going to say, you're in control. What I want you to do is take a breath in and you're going to get them to watch the dial. So watch the manometer on the front of the of the bird and get them to aim for the set pressure that you set on the on the dial at the side. So if it's 20, I want you to watch the dial and I want you to watch the watch the pin go around to 20 and I want you to keep breathing in for as long as you can while with the pin at 20 and then I want you to breathe out blow out against the machine and it will stop you're in control and I want you to repeat this for five or six breaths and just have a practice round with them and use that manometer that dial on the front for some nice visual feedback to get them to sort of see what you're asking them to do one thing you can do if they're getting it so sort of progressing your treatment what you're wanting to do throughout your, your treatment really is to gradually increase that inspiratory pressure. So the centimetres of water on the side, the limit on the side, gradually up towards 40 centimetres of water, somewhere between 30 and 40. Um, and we say 40 as our upper limit of our peak airway pressure, as we know that sort of getting onto higher pressures than this, we've, we, we cause the risk of barotrauma really. So it's the same principle for... <clears throat> any sort of positive pressure that we're using so whether that be the clear way or um, patients on ventilators when we're looking at peak pressures when we're doing things like ventilator recruitment and things like that 40 is normally our, our ceiling of of of, um, of pressure although there are some patients who are maybe established on things like clear way long term that that do possibly have um, slightly higher pressures that are a bit more tried and tested with them um, so, yeah, if we work off 40, so we're going to gradually, as they start to tolerate it, increase the the um, pressure gauge up to 40. We're going to get them to watch that dial on the front as they're taking the breaths in and hopefully get that visual feedback again from being able to achieve the higher pressures. And the higher the pressures that we can get them to achieve up to 40, we're going to slowly start to just increase that um, potential for the collateral ventilation, start to open up those small airways where we might have collapse. Other thing is we're going to want to just increase the inspiratory flow rate if we can. So that top dial on the front again, so this is going to be how fast the breath's coming at you. So how fast the breath is delivered. So what we ideally want is gradually increasing the inspiratory flow, gradually increasing the pressure and really maximising on that big breath in and getting behind any secretions, opening up any areas of collapse, get sort of blasting through any areas of secretions um, and starting to target areas of, of atelectasis and collapse. So do a little bit of a practice round first, just get your patient used to it, sort of the feeling of what it's like to, to trigger the breath and to stop the machine and just get them to complete sort of six to eight breaths, um, rest, go back on onto any oxygen that they need to and repeat for sort of three cycles or as many as your patient needs and can tolerate. Don't get them to do too many breaths at once as they will probably feel a bit lightheaded. Um, if they, let's have a look. So there's a couple of things really that have come up from a troubleshooting perspective. So probably some of the common things um, are, some of the common things are that um, the bird's just not triggering. So there's lots of little sort of quick fixes really that will um, fix this. So sounds silly, but is the bird switched on? So you might have plugged it into the oxygen supply at the wall, 
but is the the on off switch on easy mistake to make second of all is the oxygen plugged in properly so we might have we you know we might think that we've popped it into the wall um to the to the oxygen supply but it is a bit tricky and sometimes doesn't quite go in um and again just checking that all the all the connections are made so quite a one that I've done a couple of times is the pressure line isn't quite plugged in under the neb chamber or into the machine it, it slipped out um there's a couple of other troubleshooting things on there that you can refer back to but um, I think the main thing is really understanding what each of the dials does and being able to sort of troubleshoot based on your knowledge of what the dials do does so for instance you know if the patient's not able to trigger reduce the starting effort so it might just be that they can't generate enough of a, a flow to actually trigger the machine so can you know can you reduce the the inspiratory um the starting effort sorry um so there's a few other things on there so we've done our treatment um and now we need to think about well was it was it worth it was it you know was it effective so things that things that you can do is actually auscultating during your treatment so i've done this quite a few times and actually it gives you really nice live feedback as, as to you know you've identified an area that maybe sounds quieter or abnormal or bronchial or whatever you know listen over that particular area again certainly if you can get your patient sat out in a chair doing this um get you know get them to lean forwards and you can have a really good listen as they're doing it um and get some get some nice information about whether or not it's actually doing anything during the treatment listening after as well so maybe after they've they've stopped using um after they stopped actually doing the bird you know listen again after is it just improving the air entry during the treatment or is there some carryover so that's quite a nice um nice way of evaluating and then sort of the obvious ones really so you know oh, are you improving the oxygen saturations um which what you might find is certainly if you've taken somebody off a couple of litres of oxygen you've birded them getting 40 percent oxygen sort of in the in the sort of short term post treatment you might find that the saturations improve drastically and um, because you have been giving them that um higher higher level of oxygen um obviously at sort of a high flow rate whereas what you might find is actually if you wait a bit longer they might settle back down again so it's worth checking not immediately after um oxygen requirements so actually you know have you actually been able to wean down the oxygen requirements because maybe you've opened up a bit more area of atelectasis or collapse and actually improved the gas exchange secretion load so i know we probably think about the bird for volume but you know it's really quite useful and i can vouch for the fact that anecdotally certainly with some of our post-op patients who um are struggling to cough and sort of generate um enough that thoracic expansion to sort of get behind secretions actually um it, it's, it's worked wonders with with secretion load so um you know you can use your secretion load on sort of how much they've cleared or whatever um as as a bit of a analysis to evaluate how well or not well it's gone and work of breathing probably sort of as a result of the above of sort of secretion load and opening up areas of collapse um So thank you everybody for joining. Um, attached to this PowerPoint presentation will be a practical video of how we are using the bird. And again, just going over the dials and a little bit of troubleshooting stuff. So please, please find the video um, alongside this and um, thank you for listening.